、えっと、アメリカよりは日本の方が居心地いいと思っています。Welcome to the Melanated Files. In this series, we highlight and share the stories of black people from across the globe. Remember to subscribe to this channel for weekly videos and also follow us on social media for regular updates. Let's get into the interview. My name is Tiffany Rachel, and I was born in Ibaraki Prefecture, Japan. When I was four months, we moved to the States for two years, came back, I believe that was 2001, and then went to elementary school、um, up until sixth grade. And that was 2011. And that's when the big earthquake and tsunami that happened. And for those who know like, where Ibaraki is, it's pretty close to where the earthquake had occurred. And so we decided to move to the States, went to junior high school in America, went to high school in America, and then I came back 2017 as a college student. Funny enough, although Japanese is my native language, I'm studying Japanese. Kind of again to learn the part of Japanese that I missed while I was in you know, high school and during high school in America. My identity crisis, I guess, you know, being in Japan while, you know, as a、um, young student, I guess, a young person, I never really, you know, I was, I was by my name. I, it wasn't like I was Japanese, it wasn't like I was black, anything. Like, none, none of that really mattered. And then moved to, the, moved to the States, and all these people asking me questions are you black? Are you Japanese? What are you? And so it kind of hit me. Not that. So it's like the conflict kind of came to me. It's like now I have to have this definition of what I am, you know, and it's no longer by my name anymore. And I think that's, that was the frustrating part is that I'm known by being black, and being black means this, this, and that, and being Japanese means this, this, and that. And if either side, I don't fit into any criteria perfectly, which was, and it was frustrating. And it's like I had to have an identity. That was kind of the problem that I had in America. It's like, you know, people are always going to ask me questions, and I have to have an answer. I have to be ready with an answer. with... Identity, and I think that was the hardest part. But coming back now, I think I'm like kind of starting all over. I kind of left those, I guess, problems, you know, kind of behind. And now it's, I just kind of present the way that I do, and I let people, you know, kind of identify me. Like, you know, however I present myself, and however you take it, I guess, give me my identity. But I think that was a really hard、uh, thing to learn, you know, in America. In America, you know, getting to know.、Uh, Some people and、uh, making new friends, and they tell me about their experiences. And they tell me, you know, my family member got shot, a family、uh, member got murdered, and, and it was hard to not accept it, but it was hard to believe that it happens just, just right around me. And, you know, hearing all those stories, it's like it could happen to, you know, my family. And I, was, I lived in、uh, Charlotte, North Carolina, so, you know, still kind of the South Side where things are a little sticky. And so, I guess it was hard to hear those stories and it's hard to believe that it's true and that it could very much so happen to me. And I remember at one point thinking that it's not my problem because, you know, culturally I was, you know, raised in Japan, so everything, you know, derives around, you know, what goes on here in Japan. But in America, it's like, not that it didn't matter, but it's, it's like they look at you and they judge you just from your appearance. And so it's kind of like, yo, that is my people that, you know, it's, they're endangered and, It's, it's just hard to think about, and it's hard to, to, to know that, like, you know, my parents' family go through this and everything. And so I guess it was a really, really hard time, you know, being in America and learning that. And now coming to Japan, I sometimes want to express, you know, all that experience in Japan to Japanese people. But like I said, I sometimes feel like it's not their business. You know, Japan isn't really so much of a diverse place where they see a lot of black people. So sometimes, I, so my Japanese self is telling me it's not their business, but at the same time, I am black and it is my family's, you know, what they're going through and stuff. And so I guess I still currently have that conflict within myself. My parents, well, first my dad came to Japan, visited Japan for three weeks, fell in love with the country, decided to get uh, married um, and move back to Japan and, you know, make a living here. I feel like they really liked that they were considered as a foreigner rather than. Than being black. Also, my mom was pretty concerned about us maybe potentially getting bullied in school. But something that was really、uh, revealing to her, was really、uh, calming to her, was that every year in school, in elementary, we do a self portrait. And in Japanese, there's a word called hadairo, which is skin color. But hadairo is basically beige, you know, because Japanese people, that's their skin color, basically. But my hadairo is obviously different. But my mom really appreciated that the teacher took the time to find my hadairo with, you know, using you know, not only brown, but, you know, green, blue, red, just kind of using all these things to find my color. And when that happened, 
she was just like, oh wow, like they're just really accepting of her. And also, um, my mom, I remember she told me the story with my brother. My brother's very like spontaneous. He likes going places, kind of wandering, finding new things. So when he was about five, I believe, we were in a mall and he got lost. And my mom, you know, tried to look for him and, and she heard the announcement where they're making this announcement where this boy is lost. My mom kept waiting for the word black child to be announced to, for her to know that it's his, it's her child. But because they never said it, she didn't know it was her child that, that they're announcing looking for. So they're like, oh wow, like my son is really gone, X, Y, Z. But then realized when they found him that they were announcing about Ruben, but they never described his skin color. So it was like, oh wow, that's, I guess that's not the way they see him kind of thing, you know? So I thought that was very interesting where I guess in America, I guess it would be important to talk about what race or ethnicity they may be to you know, identify you know, a person. So I thought that was very interesting. But yeah, my parents do want to move back to Japan. They, my dad really feels at ease. Um, and so hopefully they will make their way over here. It's an interesting question because I felt like a foreigner more so than feeling like a black person. Um, so speaking you know, Japanese as my first language was pretty normal. I, I didn't feel really excluded from the other Japanese people or anything. So I would say it was pretty normal. It was just like, okay, I just know two languages. You know, my parents, I speak English and everything else, I speak Japanese. We did move to the States there for six years and I learned a lot of things about American culture and English and just everything all at once. And the first time learning about I guess black, you know, I didn't know what that was and there was no reason for me to know in Japan. You know, the way that I look and the way that I am, I am black, but a lot of people didn't perceive me as black because the way I speak or I say I, say I was from Japan and nobody really believed me. And so I think that was pretty, a hard transition to kind of go over. It's like, it's like me saying I'm from Japan and the way that I look didn't match. And so a lot of the times it's like, okay, Tiffany, whatever <laughs> kind of thing. So really interesting uh, time in my life, I would say. It was actually pretty normal, I would say. And I say that because although I was different and although I knew I was different, I didn't feel different and nobody really discriminated against me. Nobody really, no, nobody really told me I was different. And so I think, I think it's a hard transition going to America and then coming back now after knowing everything is that I feel like I have more knowledge about, I guess my, about like black stuff and everything. And so definitely a, a transition, I would say. That's hard because I actually never, I guess for me, like the way, like when I lived in the States and I experienced all these things, um, I didn't really feel black because I didn't know like what the definition of what it means to be black, you know what I mean? I feel like a lot of times the way I present myself, they either tell me I'm not black, I'm not Japanese, but I am black because look at me. So I think it was like a hard part just from what people are telling me. So currently I don't really go as an I identity, like, you know, I. I don't say I'm black, but that doesn't mean I go around saying I'm Japanese either. But I guess I did find out that I'm black, you know, and so I guess I'm living in that, that stage maybe. I guess because I look the same with other people who claim they're black, and so it's like, okay, I guess I'm, I'm a part of them, you know. Being black in America, there's a lot of, you know, discrimination, and there's a lot of injustice-like things. And I feel like the dangers of being black in America, I don't feel in Japan, I feel like it's very safe being over here. And I guess a part of that reason is because Japanese people don't really know about black people. So saying that you're black doesn't come with like these labels that I feel like we are put against in America. I feel safe, I can do what I want, I can, I can uh, go anywhere I want at any given time. I feel like I just have more freedom being in Japan and being black. No, I, I never knew that I was black in Japan because I sometimes, not blame my parents, but I sometimes like, Ask my parents, like, like, why didn't you guys ever explain this part of me to me, you know, when I was in Japan? And my parents actually said, like, you know, because I was never discriminated against, there was no reason to tell me about these things. I wasn't going through it. And truth be told, even if they did explain it to me, the level of, of English that I was at at the time, I probably would ha not have understood what they're talking about, what they're saying. I would probably think they're crazy. And so now thinking back, it's like, oh, okay, I, I guess that makes sense why uh, you never really told me. I, well, first of all, I guess I want to start from when I was in sixth grade in Japan. I remember learning about maybe foreign affairs and learning about America a little bit. And I remember having a conversation with um, the teacher and then my classmates about slavery in America. But it didn't really hit me. It's like I knew that was my people that went through that, but it, there was no connection. 
And so moving to the States, you know, hearing all these stories of, you know, our history and everything, it's like, oh, this was real, <laughs> like, you know, kind of thing. So it hit me. So learning that along with learning about, because I was tested, like, you know, while I was in sixth grade in America a little bit for two months, it was like, do you know who Tupac is? Do you know this music? Do you know this movie? You must have heard of it. I mean, if you say you're black kind of thing. So that's when I learned that, oh, I guess being black means knowing these things, uh, having these things, having heard of these things. And also being in sixth grade, we're all pretty childish. You know, none of us really know anything. So I guess even the white people or Hispanic people will say I'm more, they're more black than I am, you know, kind of thing. But I guess, you know, uh, from that, I also learned about like you know, pr police brutality and just how shallow I guess everything is just just by the way of appearance I guess everything is determined and that's that was the hardest part for me to learn like because I, although I saw color before you know since this birth I never saw race and it was never an issue and I learned it going to America and the hardest part was that at age 12 in America being a black kid there is nobody to really explain to you about those things because you, you, if you're black in America, then you're kind of experiencing it since birth, you know, through elementary school and everything. But me, this is like, I'm, I don't know any of this and I needed somebody to explain it to me, but I didn't know the questions to ask, no either. And so I learned it the hard way, I would say, but I don't, even looking back, I don't have any like personal experience of being discriminated against. I just, you know, hear stories. And so I learned that you have to know this. I know that you have to learn, know that. I guess some people, you know, you can say the N word and everything. And I, I guess I learned everything the hard way. So I do have like this notion of what black is. It's not really defined, but through the hard way, I did, you know, learn everything. I think identity is important, but at least to me, it's not. Um, I think categorizing just in general can be, uh, bad depending on like the situation I think. I, I know some people who you know hold on to their identity as pride and something they're proud of and I think thinking in, in that angle I think it's it's important but where things can be really complicated and I feel like sometimes it just doesn't matter because I feel like with identity it comes with like I said it comes with A, B, C, D and E and I feel like we're especially in America we're so like diverse and we have so many different patterns that you're not always going to follow those like A, B, C, D, and E, what that identity is. And so, to me, it's not important, at least. And I think, I'm sure other people, you know, have, you know, their identity in which they hold pride and they feel like it's important. I feel like there was a reason why I was, you know, born in Japan and where I was and where I lived in America for a, a quite amount of time. And now, I feel like I'm taking in everything that I learned and everything that I experienced. And I guess sharing, I think really sharing uh, and like kind of just having a conversation with people can really, inspire um, others in ways that you know you don't even know and I want to kind of be the med mediator of Japanese people and maybe Americans or probably black people just in, in specific to just kind of share you know kind of what we go through and, and especially because Japan is not a diverse you know country I think 98% um, of the population are Japanese and interestingly 2% are foreigners but of that 2% mostly are Asians and so there's not a lot of different like physical difference in Japan. So I feel like, and because Japanese people are admired by you know our skin color, our hair, our culture, I think, I feel like it's not my job, but I feel like because I speak Japanese um, natively, I feel like I can be able to ex explain to them from the jump, like kind of what, what it is. Cause I feel like, especially in America, ignorance is something that we kind of look down upon and it's not good. And, it's good to be, you know, educated. It's good to kind of know, and so I feel like when Japanese people know, get to know Black people's like culture, I feel like it's it's important to understand it the right way, or else we're gonna get offended, you know. And so I think that's my goal as I'm here, just kind of share my story and just kind of be the mediator between the two. What I like most about Japan, I think I have top three. So one is the culture, two the food, three the safety. Um, the culture, I feel like I'm just naturally used to it, I guess from being born and raised here for so long. And the food, oh, I just I just love the food. I mean, I feel like just Wahoo, just in specific, I feel like it's very healthy and I've always had a good balance. And for those who know, Ibaraki is a very agricultural site. And since I was there for about uh, 10, 11 years, I'm just so used to eating, you know, kind of healthy uh, and rich like vegetables and fruits and everything. And the safety, 
You've probably heard this before, but I feel like people here mind their business. Like if you look in trains and you see that either somebody tripped or somebody dropped something, I feel like in America you would think everybody's attention would go to that one thing that happened, but it's only me and I'm the one looking crazy, you know, looking at what happened. And I feel like just, just in general people mind their business and I really appreciate that and I really uh, feel most comfortable being here. What do I like least about Japan? I feel like it's hard for me to say this because uh, I haven't made many Japanese friends since I came back, but from the few that I did make, it's hard to talk to them about deep conversations. And I say that because I remember, you know, being in elementary and the education is more like the teacher tells you one thing and you stick with that one thing. There's no contribution back from the students to the teacher or to the classroom about what you think. And the only time you do is answering the question. So I feel like there was no like diversity in like opinions. And I feel like by bringing that out, I feel like Japan will be more diverse and I feel like we can have good conversations about social issues and I feel like a lot of social issues do continue because we don't talk about it and we, we don't know about it and we don't know what's going on. And so I feel like the lack of communication maybe, by increasing that, I think Japan will be a better country. I think maybe it's the people. I remember going to America and people, like strangers talked to me. Like even just as simple as that was like, whoa, like that happens, you know? And, I, and there was like a discomfort. Like I, I didn't like that strangers kind of talked to me, we were strangers, you know? That was an apparent difference. I think also the food. I don't know if you noticed, but like even with so food, let's say, a lot of the food, a lot of the Jap Japanese foods, you see which vegetable is in your dish. Like you kind of see an apparent difference. I feel like in America, a lot of foods are kind of mashed. Let's say like mashed potatoes. It's like you kind of recognize what's in there, but not really. And I feel like that was uh, actually kind of a struggle for me because coming from such an agricultural site in Japan, I knew what, what I was eating, let alone I also knew who grew the crop. Like I also knew like, because it's a funny story. So. I, like looking back, I realized I didn't have a grocery store in my area until I was in the fourth grade. So the way we bought groceries is that we knew which family grew what crop. So we would directly go to their place. And these people, they're like award-winning crop growers. Like they knew what they were doing. And um, the food was really, really good. And so I guess moving to America, not knowing where the food came from, not knowing um, what was in the food. I think, that was a, I think that was a little discomfort now that I look back on it. I have a funny story for you guys. So my family were basically the only foreigners I knew, along with you know people in the, in the area in Ibaraki. So we came to Ginza, Tokyo for the first time. Maybe it wasn't my first time, but I don't know. First time I remember. And I'm seeing you know, people that look like me, basically black people. And m my brother and I are basically thinking, oh my gosh, there's a cousin. Mom, dad, there's a cousin. And my parents are looking at us crazy. Like, what makes you think we're related to them? I'm like, we're the same, <laughs> like look at us, you know? And so, and now coming back to Japan, I think I, I embrace that I didn't know a lot of things. And so I see, I come to Harajuku, I go to Roppongi, and I say to my friends, oh look, there's a cousin, there's a cousin. Oh, look at the uncle, you know? I just kind of like um, have fun with it. My favorite Japanese food, I'm about to sound very, oh, what's the English word for it? Jimmy, I don't know what Jimmy is in English. I really like gyudon, I'm really like simple. I really like hijiki and I really like Gobo Sarada. I think that was my childhood right there. But really I like I like any wahoo. I think it's I, I love how like fresh and refreshing everything is, but I think those are like my top three. I guess um, my experience of being black in Japan. So I guess there's two parts to it. So the first part is from when I was born up until age twelve, in which I didn't know anything. I didn't know I was black, right? <laughs> and then now it's like me knowing that I'm black and I'm here again. From birth to age 12 I feel like a lot of people did you know kind of touch my skin and like kind of feel on it thinking it was powder and they were trying to like you know put on themselves thinking you know they're gonna I was gonna share some powder or something and also I guess it's something surprising to them is that our hair stands up like if you mess with it and because I said it because I really like the style of straight hair and I guess because I've been so influenced by all these straight hair you know females in Japan and so I flat ironed it a lot of times, I uh, relaxed it a lot of times, but they would play with my hair and it would stand up. And so I guess they were just always curious about this, you know. But I knew myself as a foreigner, not really as black. So that was, I guess, from birth to age 12. So now coming back, 
and being in Tokyo, where I guess there's a lot more people who's you know interested in you know our culture, our skin, and everything. I don't know if I really feel black. I do. I do know I'm black, but I don't know. I guess that that again derives from you know black means this, 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 and that. Like we have so many labels. But knowing that I am black and being here, I do. I do think it's it's pretty cool. I think. I think it's just a way to like kind of start over, if you know what I mean. Because in America, and being black has so many labels, but Japanese people don't know those labels. It's kind of a good way to kind of reintroduce yourself and show them you, and for them to know that that is black, you know. So I feel like it's, I feel like for those who are you know black and want to come to Japan, I think it's, I think you should do it at least once. For those, I think there are a lot of foreigners who do enjoy it and don't enjoy it. I think it depends on the person. But I think you should at least, you know, give it a shot, I would say. I don't think I ever felt like I wanted to look or be Japanese. And I say that because, let's, let's say if I was Japanese and there was like one thing different about me. It could be my hair, it could be my skin, something, just one thing. If that one thing was different about me, I would probably want to change that one thing to look more Japanese, right? But right now, as it is right now, it's my skin, it's my hair, it's a feature type, it's everything. So I've never felt like I wanted to look or be Japanese, but I did like straight hair. So I um, did relaxers um, for a long time, but you know my friends knew that you know our hair was different, so they would always just play in my hair, and my hair was like like probably this long, and I had bangs as well, so they would always like try to stand it up while I'm not I don't notice as if I'm not gonna notice, but it would stand up and it wouldn't go back down. And it was embarrassing because it took a lot of effort to you know kind of bring it back down. That's one thing that's like kind of vivid experience in my mind. I don't really remember any other, but I think there were so many that I didn't really count up. You know, it's kind of like normal. This time around, I feel like Japanese people are afraid of us. I think, I mean, and me being raised in Japan, I know that people can be shy. And so I can understand they don't want to approach, but I feel like if they did have the courage to approach, they would probably touch on you, you know, touch on your hair, but I don't, nobody has really touched. Oh, I, I did have a little grandma janitor stare at me and then touch my hair so she just like stared and watching my hands and she just keeps staring and she's like oh so pretty so pretty get it and i guess that was i liked it because it was my i guess my chance to talk to her about oh yeah this is braids it's a protective style xyz to kind of you know kind of i guess expose us you know i think japanese people think that we all look alike i'm sure they think that Maybe we all play basketball, we can all dance. I, I, every time I've met a Japanese person who likes black culture, thinks we can dance. And also, it's gonna be really bad, but, um, and I don't know how to say it in English. It's seiyo kutsuyoi, and it means like, they think that we're sexually really good. Like, I've heard that a lot. Like, it's like, look at you, like, you must be, you know, really good, like, in bed or something. I think that's a very interesting, I don't know what media they looked at, I don't know what television they looked at to think that, but I've heard that uh, here and there. So the way I take care of my hair is I use argon oil for now, and I have my mom send it to me. So when I came back 2017, I was here for about a year, and I visited back to the States, and that's when I got all my products from, like, Target, Walmart, whatever it may be. And right now, this is... It's, it's this bought hair, but I would do, like I would wash it once a week, maybe I would twist it, maybe I would braid it, and I have like some extra hair like this where I kind of like kind of throw it in every once in a while, but mainly I just use argon oil, and actually I really like the shampoos here. Before I moved to the States, there's one product we reuse all the time, it was, and bear with me, it was seaweed shampoo, and then the conditioner was like wheat or something like that, but that stuff, it really, really helped my hair. Right now, I can't find that product anymore, but I use this one shampoo where it's sunflower oil. So sunflower oil, shampoo, sunflower oil, uh, conditioner, and it really, I, I am in love with that product. Um, I think it helps pretty well. So that, basically those, that shampoo, conditioner, and then argan oil is what I use in my hair. So before, um, when we lived here, I didn't know how to, I didn't know about natural hair. I didn't know about you know, all these great things that you know, naturally grows out of our hair. So I guess the whole time I was, I just wanted to aim straight hair. That's just the style that I like and that's all I saw. I never really had anybody to look up to, to be like, hey, I, you know, oh, natural hair seems nice. And I didn't start natural hair until I moved to the States. When I moved to the States and I'm learning about braids, I'm learning about natural hair, I'm learning about all these things. It's like, whoa, like this isn't my culture, what? Um, I learned, I first started braids because I cut all my hair off. So my hair story, here we go. My hair was like probably like this length before I moved to the States. Then moving to the States, because the food is different, because 
basically the air I'm breathing is different. It broke all of my hair off until like maybe here and it just looked really, really bad. And so then I decided, okay, I'm just gonna cut my hair off, start all over, not gonna do relaxes anymore. It was getting annoying. And so went natural. And then in the beginning of my stage, I did like braids, I did faux locks, I did Senegalese. And that's when I was like, yo, this stuff is like so cool, you know? And, and so that's when I started, you know, doing hair stuff. If there's one thing I could change about the world. I think, I think this goes with like identity and categorizing. I feel like sometimes it's not needed. If we could just all be one, regardless of, you know, it, it could be race, it can be identity, it could be uh, sexual preferences. If we could just all be just one, not nation, I don't know the word. Like just kind of, if we could just all kind of unite, then it wouldn't matter, you know, these labels, these identities, these categories. And so I feel like we should just kind of, I hate to say get rid of it, because there's sometimes I guess when people feel like they need it, but I feel like sometimes it's, a, it's unnecessary. I feel like it separates us more than brings us together. One person I would like to have dinner with, dead or alive. You know, I would love to meet other people, because I know I'm not the only black person who was raised, born and raised in Japan and raised on the countryside, not in Tokyo. So I would love to meet with other black people who were raised in Japan because I feel like with my experiences, it's hard to share them because there's nobody else who can relate. So I don't know a person is like particular, but I would love to kind of get together with other people, other black people who were raised in Japan um, to kind of just talk things out because I feel like sometimes it's hard to share because you know, like I said, I can't relate to anybody. So I think that'll be a really nice you know, conversation to have. The biggest lesson I learned in life is that experience is, is your greatest teacher. And I say that because I feel like, you know, being in Japan, I had a language barrier of speaking in English. Even in America, I had a language barrier of speaking in English. So although I, I, there are a lot of teachings that were in English, I didn't really understand it until I experienced it. And even now, you know, being away from Japan for six years, there's some kind of adult conversations that I might not, I might miss or I might not understand until I experience it. And then from that, you kind of learn how to word it. But words are very limiting sometimes. Um, especially somebody who knows English and Japanese, which are very opposite, di very different languages. So I feel like through experience, you learn a lot more things than through teachings or lectures. So I think experience is, is your buddy sometimes. My earliest memory, I guess it was a kind of an embarrassing moment looking back, is that my brother and I, we were pretty young. I was probably age four, let's say, in Japan. And my parents had a lot of like foreigner friends. And this one person told us, what's up? And we didn't know what that meant. And we literally looked up, you know, it's just, it's just something, something as simple as that. I remember, and like looking back, I was probably crazy. But at the time I knew, like, that's all I knew. And so, um, so I think even that as a child kind of explains how I am, you know, I guess culturally embrace, you know, the Japanese side and physically biologically being black and so that, that's kind of me if you say what's up that's the answer you're gonna get the one thing that Japan does really well that I wish the world could know is convenience and I say that because convenience stores are literally convenience stores you know not only can you buy everything but you can order you know your Amazon package and let send to as the closest 7-Eleven to you or something, you know, in order to, you know, keep, keep your privacy for your address or something. And I feel like um, because in Japan, it's, transportation is pretty critical. I feel like there's a lot of things that are convenient. And I feel like there's a lot of things you can do outside of your house and kind of anywhere. Ooh, my favorite place in Japan. I haven't been any, everywhere, but I would have to say Kawagoe. I went there once. It's in Saitama. And when I go to new places, I like learning about the history. And Kawagoe is known as like Little Edo. And there was like an Edo period in Japan where, but that Little Edo is where a lot of exchange in goods were going. I don't know what the word I'm looking for is. And it's a really, really like cute kind of traditional area where you kind of get the feel of the history. I think, I think you should go there. I'm sure there are better places in Japan, but that's the place that I would recommend. <laughs> I think the common misconception about Japan is that you know, I feel like Japan is very, you know, popular for anime and kind of uh, entertainment kind of things. But I feel like I've, what I've heard from other foreigners is that when you come here, foreigners would expect the Japanese people to act the way that you see in anime, that you see in, you know, these movies and stuff. But it's actually 
the people aren't like that. And I say that because I feel like their ideas go on like a hundred, that their creation, their anime, this, these things make Japan portray a certain way that they're really not. It's just that normally, you know, they're just, you know, they're just Japanese people, but their creativity comes out in those entertainment things. And so, but Americans are only seeing, or just foreigners are just looking at that. So I feel like, but I mean, it's not, it's not untrue. It's just that that's not, like, don't make that connection. Don't think that they're the same, you know, it's just their creativity coming out, not that it's them. I feel like Japan needs to have a conversation about diversity and how different people can be depending on their backgrounds. And I think I say this a lot, but um, because people in Japan don't don't talk, and not that they so much so have a reason to, because 98% of the population are Japanese. So, so it's like there's like just one set of mindset that's kind of roaming around. But what they don't know is that there is other patterns, there is other backgrounds in which I feel like Japan should know about, especially with the 2020 Olympics coming up and Japan, you know, they need to open up to other countries because they are going through a, you know, a crisis in the economy and like, you know, the population decreasing and everything. And so if they want to accept, you know, start accepting foreigners, in which I think they probably will, they need to also understand other cultures, you know. I think now is the best time for them to kind of initiate that movement. My proudest accomplishment, I feel bad <laughs> because I can't think of one. I think surviving through being in the States, and I hate saying that, but I think the six years I've been in America, exponentially, it just got worse and worse and worse to the point where it's like, okay, I need to come back to Japan. But I feel like, you know, if I could talk to my younger self now, I feel like I would apologize to her because of all the things that, she, you know, she was going through, I never really sat down and kind of reflected with myself. So I know it gets like really deep, but I feel like it was just a really hard time that I never really looked back or really went through myself. But I, so I feel like, not really an accomplishment, but I feel like I did come out of a, a dark time into light. Okay, so because in Japan, I've never been really challenged, I've never really been discriminated, I've never been done wrong in Japan. Going to America was not only learning about the things that go on in America, but also it was a time when I was becoming a pretty young adult. So it was kind of all that in a short period of time that I was going through. So I feel like I've been like ran over a few times and kind of taken advantage of here and there in which I didn't really like stand up for myself. So there was no need to when I was in Japan. I never had to, I didn't know how to. And so I, I think I learned a lot of that in the States. And so coming back, I'm definitely, you know, more, more toughened up and everything. But I feel like coming out of that situation was, was pretty hard. I, there's one point when I felt like I, I was gonna be stuck in America for a very long time. And, just the thought of that, I, I like visiting the States, it's fine, but I can't see myself living in the States. I feel like I've been taken advantage of because you know how they say um, when you're nice to people, then I, f I feel like you know things can go wrong with people taking advantage of your kindness, basically. And so, but and so I, I never had to be rude to people to kind of get what I want. Like, I, there was no need to, like, why are you going to be rude to somebody, kind of, you know? And I feel like there was a lot of times when I need when I had to kind of stand up and be mean and, you know, to kind of snap out of, you know, them coming at me like that. So I, I went through a few things through that in which I know how to handle now. But I feel like that was a hard part to learn. I had to learn the hard way. And it's not like I wanted, I'm a very like, like independent person. So I don't like asking for help unless it's necessary. But at the same time, you know, I could have talked to my parents about it. I could have opened up to them, but there was still this barrier of me not being able to express what I, how I'm feeling in English fully. And their Japanese wasn't, isn't good enough for me to say how I feel and for them to understand and to know what response to give me to help through. So I, I feel like I've always kind of been to myself. And so with that said, I think all that included, I feel like I did go through a pretty harsh time and which was necessary because what I've experienced has made me the person that I am today. And I really like the person that I am today. And so I feel like all that experience was, was, was very much so necessary, although it was pretty bad. So a piece of advice, if you're black wanting to come to Japan, do it. Secondly, I would say come with an open mind. I felt like when I was in America, kind of hearing out what other black people said, you know, growing up black in America, you have this notion of how the world is. But sometimes it's just what happens in your area and in America that doesn't necessarily happen in, in Japan or anywhere else. And I'm not saying that's, that's true, but I feel like most of the time that's how 
that's how you would view the world. If that's all you know, then that's all you know. But Japan is an opposite country. I know I shared a lot, but that's still not enough to explain everything you would experience for you coming here. And you know, if you want to come over here, kind of experience what it's like, I think it's, I think it will open your mind to how you know other parts of the world is. And so I think Japan is one of those you know places where you you should visit. I think because I mean I've always really liked words. And knowing English and Japanese, I, I mean, still currently, I kind of want to be a translator of some sort. I feel like I can read between the lines sometimes. So let's say, a lot of times I have to translate, let's say, my parents to a teacher in Japan or something. And Japanese is a very high cultural uh, context, like, like language and place, so not everything is explained thoroughly, in which I would have to kind of fill in the blanks in English and in English, everything is too explained, and so I have to kind of break it down in Japanese. So I feel like I can kind of read between the lines. And let's say if I'm uh, sitting at a table with a Japanese person and an American, and things aren't really communicated well, they're kind of confused at what each other is saying. I feel like I'm pretty good at being the middleman and kind of explaining through what they're really thinking and how they didn't express it and which didn't communicate to the other side and vice versa. I think I'm pretty good with that, but only because I've had to deal with it for all my life and even now. So for an advice for those who are learning Japanese, don't base the Japanese language to English. So let's say I tried to teach somebody aiueo, right? And in English, the first, oh, aiueo are letters, uh, kind of alphabets, not really, yeah, yeah, vowels. And so, and I try to write out kind of A, B, C, D, E, but people thought, you know, ah, since it's A, it's kind of similar, that E was B, and then U was C somehow. Like, they kind of base their mindset on English, and I feel like you should kind of break out of that. Once you know a little bit, then you can start, you know, translating, comparing, how would you say this in English and how is it Japanese, but when you're first starting, just, just learn without comparing. I think that's... Um, a good advice to give. Yeah, so I think uh, for parents, uh, foreigner parents who are here in Japan, I do know that uh, foreigner parents send their kids to international schools, which is basically uh, English speaking um, school. But I feel like if you're not in Tokyo, maybe, I mean, if you're in Tokyo, I guess it's really the parents' decision. But I think it's good to send your kid to a regular Japanese school um, if possible. And I say that because my parents, uh, we had a rule in the house where in the house we had to speak English, but otherwhere else, you know, we could speak Japanese, it's fine. But just in the house, just kind of speak English. And, you know, I watched American TV shows, read some English books here and there. And I think that was good because I not only learned English and Japanese at the same time, I feel like that allowed me to not always be with my parents, I guess. Like, I kind of just like, I don't know if I said that right. But I guess like, um, I guess being in Japan and just knowing English, I feel like, not that I have a problem with it, I just feel like, I feel like you should learn language while you're here kind of thing. That's how I feel about it. And I feel like your child will turn out just fine. For me, if I could reflect and look back, I feel like I did need more English assistance. But the thing for me is that my parents, since they had their own company of teaching English, they were always out and about doing things. So I wasn't always with my parents, which didn't give me always a chance to speak English. But if you're not so busy and if you have time to be with your kids, I feel like, I feel like having both English and Japanese can, you know, um, help the child. And I think it's good, you know, to, um, if you're in Japan, to, to learn the language. Uh, my experience uh, in Japan schooling for elementary, I loved it because I felt one with everybody. And I have to say, my school was very, very tiny. So because we lived on the countryside, the whole school population was just 60 kids. And my grade was just seven people. But I felt like they were my brothers and sisters. Um, I felt like really connected with them, that you know we did everything together. You, we knew where we lived. We knew their phone numbers. We knew, like, we just knew everything about each other. And I think that was, I think it was a really cool experience, and especially as a foreigner, not feeling like a foreigner in such an environment. America I'm 
いつもあの説明するのがまあ面白いっていうか I said something like、um, you know being in Japan I didn't feel so much like a foreigner、um, although I knew I was a foreigner I didn't、uh, I didn't really feel so much like so and then now being in America and coming back to Japan I have to and like once I speak Japanese I have to like explain to them that I'm not half you know I was just kind of born and raised here、um, for so long that I would say Japan feels more like home for me. So you know, in, in America, it's, it's normal to say that if you're born in the states, that you are American. In Japan, it doesn't really go that way.、Um, I think there's like, if I'm not mistaken, there's like a rule that、um, you have to be in Japan for a certain amount of time and you have to apply for citizenship or whatever. So I am American citizen、um, because my my parents are American. How do I feel about that? I think, for me, not that it makes sense, but I think it is more controlled because. You know, soil is soil, and so it's like just because you're raised on that, you're born on that soil. I guess thinking about American history, it does make sense because that's just the foundation of the country, kind of. But and it could be the, the fact for Japan too. But I feel like it's it's more controlled to say that to to go by citizenship of your parents than simply where you're from. So I'm not really upset that I'm not a Japanese citizen. To me, it it kind of makes sense, and it could be because I was raised here for so long. I just the way I think is kind of more like a Japanese person. Um, so to me, that makes sense at least. Do I want to be a Japanese citizen? I,、uh, I never really, not really.、Um, I think I'm fine, just the way it is.、Um, and especially, in, let's say in the long run, if anything happens to my parents, if anything happens to a family member, I think it's easier to access America as an American citizen than as a Japanese citizen. So, for me, I, I think it's a bit much to change my citizenship. I, I'm okay with the way it is right now. But you can find me on Instagram. I'm mostly on there at tiffrichx.、Um, That's really the main thing that I use. So if you have、uh, any thoughts that you got from what I said, or just any opinions, I would love to hear it.、Um, I like sharing just as much as I like listening. So I would love to, you know, have a conversation with you. So contact me whenever. Thank you so much for watching. If you would like to share your story or have us visit your region, send us a message on any of our social media platforms or via our website. That's good.